Mayor Ed Murray, thank you very much. Thanks for your time. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Well, we're facing a crisis of homelessness. You've declared a state of emergency along with the King County Executive, Dow Constantine. Yet, we're in a city that's booming economically right now. Uh, and it seems like it's, it's kind of baffling in the fact that we have this economic growth and at the same time, this homeless crisis. Mm -hmm. What's going on? Well, it's, uh, you've described exactly what, what we're seeing in Seattle. In some ways, things have never been better. 3%, uh, 3.5% unemployment, an incredibly innovative growing economy. Folks are moving here from all around the world. It, right beside that, we have um, a homeless crisis uh, similar to the Great Depression. It's almost where it's, we're trying to deal with the Great Depression. At the same time, we're trying to deal with the booming economy. We're seeing this in Vancouver, British Columbia, in Portland, in Santa Barbara, San Diego, California, you know, up and down California. Hawaii. Hawaii. Hawaii has Hawaii. also declared a state of emergency. Yes, the whole state has declared a state of emergency. So I, uh, the question that you asked, though, is, is why? And I think one of the uh, maybe mistakes we are making is we're using the term homelessness to describe a series of crises. Um, the Seattle Times pointed out that the, the young men accused, the teenagers accused in the murders in an area commonly known as the jungle, um, are part of a failed um, child care and foster care system. Um, we have a heroin epidemic. Uh, we have uh, folks who are veterans who are traumatized and, and um, are living in these encampments. And we have people who actually you know, are struggling economically. So we have a series of crises that are happening. And we didn't get here overnight. Uh, we got here with decades of cutting mental health treatment, and I didn't men mention that a big part of our problem is mental health issues. Uh, an addiction um, uh, uh, care that is, has been slashed. Um, and just the loss of affordable housing for, for the middle class, uh, much less people who are struggling at the lower ends. I think all these things have come together. Um, and I think Seattle, San Francisco, we see it. People move west when they're looking for an opportunity. And I think some folks have ended up on our streets here uh, because they were looking for that, that job because it wasn't working out where they were from. Um, others are here uh, because they are, I mean, others are homeless because they are from here. Um, because again, of that mental health system, um, the, the, the issue of addiction, the, the heroin epidemic that is massive. It's all contributing, which means there isn't going to be a single way out of it. Is it a West Coast thing? Well, certainly New York City, as we read in the newspapers, is having a pretty difficult time. Um, the West Coast in particular seems to be hit pretty hard, though. You mentioned you know, so many different factors here. Yeah. Uh, but it seems to me that, that probably the biggest challenge is the mental health issue. Mm -hmm. Because you have so many people that are on the street that uh, have those issues. Are we failing to understand that? Well, and I think, yes, I think we are failing to understand it. We have the second highest rate of mental illness in, in the state, meaning am among the 50 states where we're number two in the f number of us who suffer from mental illness. We're at the bottom in what we offer for treatment. So I think that's why you see so many people who are clearly mentally ill. Add into that that we're in the midst of a heroin epidemic uh, that sometimes is one of the ways some mentally ill people try and self-medicate. Um, and the problem becomes even more complex. I was at uh, the barber shop recently, and the woman that cuts my hair was in quite a mood that day talking about homelessness. And what I, what I noticed is just this anger about it, mm -hmm. and blaming the city, mm -hmm. blaming you, mm -hmm. blaming the f uh, maybe the situation and the feeling that, that Seattle is too soft. Mm -hmm. when it comes to dealing with the homeless, mm -hmm. and shouldn't be. Mm -hmm. How do you respond to that? Because there is this anger out yeah, there. Yeah, no, there, there's anger. And part of the anger is frustration, and part of the anger, I think, is honest fear about what are we going to do for folks who are suffering on our streets. For those who think we're too soft, um, you know, another aspect of homelessness is some of the folks in RVs and tents are actually involved in crimes. and. The police department, and our police department has had a rough road to come back to be uh, the force it is right now, which I think is pretty good. Um, our chief, our police, are actually arresting people in RVs. So is there a distinction in 
what the police then are doing in these arrests? Yeah, let me, let me be sure I'm being clear. There's sometimes people are conflating homelessness with crime, and I think that is a huge mistake. On the other hand, there are people, some people in illegal encampments, RVs or tents, who are involved in criminal activity. And the police are arresting those folks, um, regardless of what we hear from some of the neighborhoods. They have been, and they continue to be. So we're working on that piece of it. But I'm not sure what she would have us do with folks who are mentally ill and or um, you know, just simply homeless because they lost their job. But what should we do with the 3,000 families in this city uh, whose kids are in our public schools and they don't have a permanent residence? The 40 kids any night in this city who, and I'm not talking teenagers, I'm talking little kids who absolutely do not sleep in any sort of shelter on our streets. What are we supposed to do, like round them up and sh take them across the, the invisible border of the city? Uh, I don't think that's going to be an answer. And I also think it's a little, I have to say to that person, as I said, I get the frustration and the fear, but to say it's Seattle and to ignore what's happening in cities up and down the West Coast and in other places in America, um, to ignore the fact that we have seen half of the federal money for affordable housing that used to create the great middle class affordable housing boom that we had in this country for over two generations. To, to see that go away um, is also something that she needs to look at. Seattle is doing a lot, but Seattle by itself through crime prevention, through homeless services, through building more affordable housing, we are not going to be able to solve this problem by ourselves. Others say that all we're doing is throwing money at it mm -hmm. and that we're not getting anywhere. So I think, again, uh, as in the person who's angry and, and I suspect fearful, there's, there's a piece of, of truth in this as, as well. Um, there is a lot of fear about it. Yeah. Uh, when, I, when I came into office, I asked uh, uh, for an analysis to be done by John Okamoto, who at that time was acting uh, human service director. Uh, we looked at what the federal government with the Obama administration has said about Seattle King County and our service delivery and they have said we are not doing a good job. We do some things great but our shelter system is not working. People stay in our shelters for months, for years. One gentleman has been in our shelter for 30 years. Shelters are about being there for a number of weeks and then moving into housing so that we can then get more people off the street. Uh, we fund programs um, not based on outcomes. We fund programs because they offer a service. And so we have been involved in a really difficult discussion about how we're going to start funding those programs that actually show us that they can reduce the number of people who are homeless. That's going to be a very difficult discussion. And we've started it, but it's going to be very difficult in a city that doesn't like to cut any program regardless of what the outcome is. So are you saying that to those programs out there that are receiving city money that aren't showing results, they may not be getting city money? I think the city and the county, I think we're both, and again, the county and the city work on many of these issues together because the county has the mental health and, and, and uh, other aspects of it that the city doesn't, um, uh, it doesn't uh, offer. Um, but together, I think we are pretty committed that we have to change our funding model. Um, we've got to look at the programs upstream. We've got to stop having this debate around um, uh, ten cities and encampments and shelters and cleanups and actually start debating the fact that we're going to have to make some pretty difficult decisions to fund those programs that actually get people out of homelessness and not fund those others. You know, it was John Kennedy that said, uh, you know, the famous line, ask not what, you can, mm -hmm. what the country can do for you, but what you can do for, for the country. Um, are you now asking the people of Seattle to consider that line and how they can handle or what they could do about homelessness in this city? Well, I mean, I, it just, yes, I mean, we are. And I have to say two things. First of all, I think Seattle, I think Seattle King County are very generous in our willingness to use our tax revenue um, to fund uh, programs to help the homeless. And I'm not going to ask them to do more. I think it's time, though, for this, the people in this city and in this county to ask our state and our federal government to re-engage on this issue and become our partners. So that's one thing I would ask them to do. Secondly, I think that there's just a lot we can do to be compassionate. Um, our food banks are often maxed out in this city. Um, uh, 
those folks who, who work in church groups or um, with shelters are always in need of help. Um, I think I would ask people to look for, at other ways that they could help with this issue. Is there another city that you look to as a model for this, or do you look to create that model here? So I, I, I don't. There are practices in other cities that we're very interested in. Um, San Francisco is experimenting with something called a navigation center that's a different approach to going out and basically moving entire communities. Of, and the homeless folks tend to start to bond with each other when they're in one part of a city to move entire communities, whether they're couples or they have a pet. Um, it's a different approach. We're very interested in that approach. Um, we absolutely have to do mental health better than we do, and we can look to almost any other state and find better models of mental health. Um, so, I, and, and you know, the West Coast mayors, the, the, the major cities we met in December around this issue, and exchanged best practices. So there are things that we think that we can learn in this city and use here. But I can't point to a city um, with a thriving economy and a good social safety net and say that that would work here. So you need to create it here. We need to create it. There are best practices. Uh, we do know that we need to work on our shelter system. Um, and and some, I'm going to sound a little rep repetitious on this. Uh, we know we need to deal with folks who are, who are addicted. Um, there's a slice of folks who are veterans. In some cities, New Orleans, which is a pretty challenged city, has been able to end homelessness for veterans. I think that's a slice of it that we should be able to do here in the city and the state and quite honestly in the region. Um, but it's going to be tough. How do you answer those that say that, that you're not really giving um, enough input in listening to communities when there are encampments put into place. Yeah. I, I point to Ballard because I live right. there and right. I actually moderated a, a number of conversations where people came out and were quite angry about, mm -hmm. you know, putting a, an encampment mm -hmm. next to like off of Market Street right. or where an area is going to be where the RVs are going to be parking right. and they say that, you know, we're not getting a voice in this. So I, I think we may need to make a distinction between unauthorized encampments where there's a lot of garbage and human waste and needles, sometimes crime related to it, and a whole bunch of other issues um, that really have neighborhood neighbors uh, and neighborhoods um, pretty up in arms over it. We need to distinguish that from the conversation that went on in Ballard. From the beginning of that effort with the city council, to the opening of an encampment, a legal authorized managed encampment in Ballard, was almost a year. 66 people died. I wouldn't choose to force a legal authorized supervised encampment on any neighborhood that didn't want it, nor would I think any elected official, except we don't have a lot of choices. We have people dying on our streets. More people dying in our streets than died in the Oso landslide. Um, so I think this is a case where that conversation by some folks in Ballard could have been far more constructive. But to say a year of process uh, is not um, listening to folks, I, I can't buy that. It just feels like an excuse to avoid, you know, having what I've had on my street, a legal authorized encampment, not once but twice. That, by the way, in our neighborhood, in the parking lot that it was in, the church parking lot, turned out to be a value-added experience. Um, yeah. It's, it's no, no, you know, no elected official wants to stick it to the neighborhoods. That makes no political sense. But we are in a massive national crisis. And if those folks don't get it, then I would ask them to go down to Portland, to go to the streets of San Francisco, to go to Santa Barbara and San Diego, to go to Hawaii and look what's happening here. We're talking with Mayor Ed Murray, uh, and we are in his offices uh, uh, in uh, downtown Seattle. For those of you who might have heard the sirens going by and, <laughs> and uh, the traffic, um, how is this affecting you? I mean, particularly the, the night you give a speech about, about what you want to do about homelessness uh, and also talking about what you'd like to do regarding housing. And then you find out that there's a shooting in the jungle. Well, you know, it's tough. Um, I think about the night that I went from a memorial service at SPU where there had been a, um, a shooter who had tried to take out a whole bunch of students and killed a student uh, to a memorial in South Seattle for uh, 
East African and African American young man, last seen coming out of a gay bar who were murdered, shot to death. Um, and you can't help but have it affect you. I mean, I walked away from that situation, though, more, I think, committed and energized um, and passionate about what we're going to do around gun violence, particularly among young black men in this city. Uh, when it comes to this issue of homelessness, um, the situation that I see, including that night with the tragic murders, it, it just makes me want to double down and find a solution. And, you know, and the issue of homelessness may be more than any other one that I've dealt with. Um, it touches who I am as a person. It touches my values. I come out of the social justice um, background of the, of the Catholic Church. Uh, commitment to the poor and homeless is a key value. Um, trying to find a way that I can contribute to solving this problem. Uh, it energizes me. But I'll, I'll tell you, it is not easy to go to bed at night and realize that you have thousands of people in your city that are sleeping on the streets, um, that are dying from drug overdoses, um, that are being murdered or raped. It is not easy. But I think it's at times like this that, um, you know, myself and the council will prove that we're leaders or, or we'll prove we're not leaders. Will there be more sweeps? Will there be uh, cleanups in the jungle and other unauthorized places? So, uh, you know, sweeps is a term that I think was applied to a method that was used in previous administrations. Um, what we are actually doing is cleanups and interventions. But I don't like that word. Uh, because we're not going in and sweeping people out. So I think, it is a, I think the word is, is, is not fair. Um, it's, it, it sounds like a couple administrations ago when advocates and the mayor were fighting over what were <clears throat> sweeps. We're giving people warning. We're going in. We're offering services. We're offering shelter. We're offering medical care. We're offering mental health treatment. We clean up garbage. We clean up human waste. We clean up needles. And when those folks are absolutely resistant, and some are, to being moved, then we do move them. Because there is nothing humane, and I, I know I'm repeating myself to some of your listeners, there's nothing humane about leaving people in tents where they can be run over by a car on, next to the freeway, where people have been murdered, and before the murders of recent weeks, where people are raped. The reported violent crimes in the area underneath I-5, which is state property, um, are huge and massive and ugly. There is nothing humane about not going in there, trying to offer people services, and when they won't take them, moving them out. I, I it's tough. Like, it's tough. And, you know, again, I mean, I'm, uh, <clears throat> again, coming from that, that Catholic social justice background, the other night I was asking my husband, Michael, I was saying, my God, what would St. Francis do? I can't imagine St. Francis would clean out people. Uh, it's a tough situation to be in. Um, but I also think it is... Um, the only way we are going to move some people along. I sense some frustration on your mm -hmm. part with some of, I, I suppose, the criticisms you hear, mm -hmm. but also um, just the efforts and... and yeah, I, I think the frustration comes from, um, you know, we watched a social experiment for 35 years in this country that began in the Reagan administration that just slashed the very things that we need today. Affordable housing, because some people in those encampments actually have jobs. Um, affordable housing, um, uh, housing services for the homeless, addiction treatment, mental health. These things have been slashed and slashed and slashed. And what frustrates me is I think that since most cities are governed by Democrats, that our friends on the right wing who slash these programs are probably having just the time of their life watching progressives people on the left, left Democrats, left socialists, tear each other apart over a shrinking uh, slice of the pie versus uniting and showing that we can create a movement in this country that can change this problem. That's where my frustration comes in. It comes in with this, um, and I'll be very, very clear here, this stupid brain-dead argument where we accuse each other of being the holier-than-thou person on homelessness, the person more left on homelessness. That accomplishes nothing. Uh, I think even the folks that I disagree on strategies, I think they, they are great people. The, our failure is to come together and create a movement. So, you know, either we create a national movement 
and get in the face of people in this nation who created this crisis? Or we just sit here and tear each other apart and show people that basically, well, when see what happens, America? When Democrats or Democrats and socialists get in control of the city, they just rip each other versus coming up with solutions. That's where my frustration comes from. I can tell. <laughs> um, I want to come back to the fact that we are uh, we have an economic boom going on mm -hmm. here, and this, you know I've heard you say this before mm -hmm. that uh, you know you know a lot of mayors that would like to be in mm -hmm. your spot right. in uh, having the uh, prosperity and the mm -hmm. growth that we're having here, but yet we still have this kind of kind of uh, gap mm -hmm. between and growing between those that have and those that don't, mm -hmm. and that middle that is that is lacking. Right. Where do we, how do we shrink that middle? Again, Seattle by itself is not experiencing this crisis, and this is not just cities. This is suburbs across the country. This is small towns and big cities across the country that are experiencing the loss of affordable housing. Um, and this is where I'm very happy to be mayor of a city that's actually coming up with solutions. Uh, first of all, we got together developers and housing advocates who fought with each other for 20 years. And we came to an agreement on 60 um, program ideas that we are going to implement to make this city more affordable. Uh, 50,000 new family units in the next 10 years, 20,000 at the low end, um, with the private sector agreeing to build a good chunk of those. Uh, the housing levy, we're going to put it back on the ballot in, a, in probably August. <clears throat> and uh, uh, again, a housing levy that has passed for 30 plus years, it gives us an opportunity to build yet more affordable housing. Um, that's how we're going to do it in this city. We're going to have this thing called mandatory inclusionary um, housing. In other words, if you build a multifamily complex in the city of Seattle, in one of our urban villages, you're going to build affordable housing. We haven't done that before. We built a lot of uh, units. You can see the cranes all around. But we didn't build affordably. This is a pretty exciting idea. And we're hearing from other cities around the country that want to figure out how we got our business community and our advocates together. With the housing levy, again, you're asking mm -hmm. people to pay more in taxes. Mm -hmm. I mean, how much more can we ask? You know, it's going to be about $5 a month more for doubling the housing levy. Um, Seattle as a city, um, if you look at the medium tax rate on, on a homeowner, it is less than Bellevue and Redmond and a bunch of other cities that surround us. So there's a little bit of a confusion that somehow we're a high t property tax city compared to our neighbors. Uh, you know, regrettably, we have a fairly regressive tax system in Washington State, and the property tax is one of the few places that we can go um, to provide the very services that people want. People don't want to see homeless people. We got to build affordable housing. People are frustrated about traffic. We need to. We need more transit, which we're doing. Um, you know, people want to do something about the number of, of African American students who don't graduate from our high school. That answer is partly lies in pre-K. Those are the things that we're funding. I think those make for a more affordable city. I want to turn the page here a little <coughs> bit and ask you about the police department. Uh, the progress. Where are we with the consent decree? Are you uh, feeling that the the chief is? making the progress that is necessary and building trust with uh, communities of color? I think, I think we're on the road, um, and I think we've made progress. Um, the federal court has acknowledged that our police uh, force is making progress on police reform, on police accountability. Um, uh, the mo federal monitor who you know, oversees our police force has, uh, the U.S. Attorney General has, so we're seeing indications that we're moving forward, that we are now becoming a bit of a model for how you deal with um, uh, escalation, crises that turn quickly violent, that our police force is becoming leaders in how to de-escalate. Uh, folks are coming from around other, the country from other police forces to look at that. Some of the monitors own uh, studies show that communities throughout this city are feeling better about the police force, communities of color except for the African-American community, where the numbers have not moved. Uh, but unlike almost every other city in America, those numbers have not, got, not, got, not gone backwards. So what we're seeing is movement, but we're not there yet. Um, and if you look at the police force I inherited and the police force we have today, 
Um, we have a police force that is making progress on relations with communities of color that has had thousands and thousands of contact with people who are in some sort of crisis with practically no use of force, much less inappropriate use of force. And we have a police force who's back out there dealing with one of Seattle's you know, long-term crime issues, property crime. And we're actually seeing crime overall over the last year come down in Seattle. So I think our chief and the leadership team that she has put together is changing this police force. But with the African American community, what, what, what's it going to take to bridge that, that concern? Well, I, I, it's, going to, you know, it's not going to be easy. And I think part of it is um, the police force is often at the, the tail end of a whole bunch of other systems that have failed when it comes to the issue of race, particularly to, in the African American community. A school system that is simply expelling and or not graduating uh, African American students. A foster care system that certainly doesn't help them. Um, a, a prison system, the pipeline that we often talk about. So the police often see the tail end of that. And so we can continue to do the great community building um, exercises that they're going through. And I want to talk about a couple of them. But that number, particularly for the African American community, is going to de be dependent to some extent on how we deal with race in some of our other institutional um, entities uh, in this city, in this state, in this country. You know, I, I um, we had a group of mostly East African um, women who spent uh, a part of uh, last year um, uh, with 20 women police officers, getting to know each other's cultures, getting to know each other's community. Uh, this year, the police force is doing that, particularly with young African American men, uh, police officers and young African American men getting to understand each other, getting to understand each other's culture. It's those sorts of things that can make a difference. Um, but this, I mean, this doubles back on, we've talked about homelessness, we've talked about addiction, we've talked about affordable housing, big challenges for a city. But race remains this country biggest challenge and the relationship to people who are black, whether East African or African American, is the core problem that we face. And that shows up with the police. Even as progressive as we are as a city, we, we are uh, still struggling with race? Well, we are progressive, but you know, and sometimes I think we're a little more progressive in our minds than we are in reality. This is a city that is not an island, f you know, disconnected from the rest of the state or the rest of the country. Um, our school system is struggling with some pretty poor results over a generation. Uh, we need to own that in a way we have not owned it. Um, so, no, we're, we're not immune from issues of racism in Seattle. As good as I know people are, and as great as I know people are in their feeling to get over this issue, we're not going to do it unless we actually, I think in Seattle, spend a little more time admitting that we actually have it. <clears throat> One uh, final thing I'd like to, to get your thoughts on. Uh, I, I, I'm sure that you've been watching what's been happening national, nationally with the uh, presidential uh, candidates yeah. uh, on both sides of the aisle. Um, who do you favor on the Democratic side? Joe Biden. <laughs> <laughs> is that because he's a fellow Irishman? What is that? <laughs> well, we do share some things in common. Yeah. We both like to talk. Um, so, uh, what, so you're That's a good line. That was a very good line. Sorry. Yeah, I like that. I like that. Yeah. Uh, I mean, did you want me to talk about the race? Was that it? I don't know. I mean, who do you, uh, have you decided or are you? I'm not, I've not decided. Um, I, I do think that, I think both parties didn't get something that I think Seattle got, which is people, are, there is churn out there. There is frustration out there. The economy may be coming back, but lots of people, their lives have not come back the way they were before. Um, I think that um, what worries me about the Democratic candidates is uh, Bernie Sanders, I'm afraid, um, is offering one version of the world. Um, and while I may agree with a lot of it, it's how do you get it done? Uh, Secretary Clinton, I think, is doing something very different than what we've done. We said we're pragmatic, but we set our heights really high, highest minimum wage in the country. Uh, what will end up being the largest uh, housing affordability proposal in the country. Um, and I think she has done the pragmatic thing without enough of the vision. I think Senator Sanders is doing too much of the vision um, without enough of the practical. And I'm worried about what that might mean for the Democratic Party. 
On the Republican side, um, I, I mean, you know, I, I believe that you need more than one party. And I'm very concerned that the, that the Republican Party seems to have gone to a place that just four years ago we would never, um, as a nation, tolerate it, where you can denigrate entire groups of people, Muslims, immigrants, whoever it is, uh, and get away with it. Although, as I hear myself saying this, maybe I need to correct myself. I did spend 18 years in the legislature um, leading efforts uh, on, on gay and lesbian, bisexual, transgender, civil rights, and marriage, where all I heard was my community being denigrated. So it just seems to have gone to a higher level on the Republican side. But what I, I, I want to end with, uh, with that question, nobody is talking about the problems of urban America, whether that is the big cities or our metropolitan um, neighbors like in like a Bellevue or a Sacramento. Nobody is talking about housing affordability. Nobody is talking about homelessness. So I'm waiting to hear that. Mayor Ed Murray, thank you for your time and uh, we'll talk more next okay. time. Good, look forward to talking to you again. All right. Thanks.